Hi everyone, welcome to a new episode of Caroline Talks, the podcast slash YouTube channel where I, your host, Caroline Hines, will speak to um, film or TV creatives about their art, their craft, and what got them into filmmaking. And today I am joined by director Jerry Hoffman to discuss his new film, his new sci-fi short, I Am, as well as with creative producer um, Stella Flicker. And this is an interesting sci-fi short, it's very... Uh, What's the word? It can be disconcerting if you're like me and you don't trust androids and technology. I do not. Technology is my full, my consistent emesis. <laughs> and this <laughs> film kind of touches on some of the reasons why I don't trust technology. And But before we get into that, I'm going to ask Jerry and Stella to just say a bit about themselves and what got them into filmmaking. So we'll begin with Jerry. Thank you so much for having us and what a, what a great introduction. Thank you. Uh, I'm an actor. I actually came, I, I played the, when I was very young and uh, started my way into film and theater. And like some years ago, I decided to go more behind the camera and tell my own stories because there's such a lack of different stories in the German European film landscape that I had the need and urge to tell my own stories and have like an uh, authentic standpoint on that. That's, mm. that's my journey. <laughs> and Stella? Uh, my my journey is I've um, I've always wanted to be a film producer actually, um, and um, yeah I really like the the mix between being creative and being in control and um, just <laughs> being on top of the news and the organization, um, and I'm really happy to meet and have met Jerry in my master studies in Hamburg and we've made two amazing uh, I don't want to say amazing to, about my own films but two really fun movies. Um, that we've made together. I'm really happy. Hmm. No, if the film, if you think the film isn't making, you think the film isn't making. That is it. Like you, you guys <laughs> did a lot, put a lot of work. The in process was amazing. amazing. The process was amazing. Maybe not the movie. That's what I meant. <laughs> Own it. <laughs> it's yours. <laughs> My dog is next to me, and I'm here hoping she doesn't start barking. She, she wants to be part of the podcast. It's her she, chance now. She's, very she's here dreaming. Part. She's she's here dreaming in her sleep, running in her sleep. I'm like, girl. Well, well <laughs> in the next movie, we'll create an android dog. Oh, please, no. <laughs> <laughs> we had enough of that with Black Mirror. Like, these people in the US now have the police and um, robots. Mm -mm. <laughs> We've seen it. Yeah, crazy. Yeah. And I think that is actually the perfect way to start our discussion about I Am because it's about these two female characters. One is human, Noe, played by Sherry Hagen, and Ila, played by Melody Vaki Vu Amina. And she's an android, and she's a very interesting android in that she has her own ideas and ideals and dreams, and which I think is interesting because her dreams aren't actually dreams in the way we would think of it, but she has what we would call a goal that she wants to achieve. And it's basically about wanting to be human. She wants to be Noe. So can you just tell me, Jerry, a bit how you came up with the concept for this film and the idea? And, and I think it's interesting that you as a male um, director made the film about two female characters because it's written by Florence Hun. So can you just tell me how you, um, how you guys became involved with the project and like creating this story? Sure, I mean, we, as Stella mentioned, it, it was a crazy and amazing shoot. We had a previous production that we did in the beginning of the school, and then we knew we wanted to do the thesis together. Um, we had a great script that we all were passionate about, and then the worldwide pandemic happened, and it was like risk uh, characters. We had club scenes with a lot of characters, so it was very clear we can't shoot the script, so we needed to come up with something else. And we had a lot of crazy and amazing brainstorming sessions, and then suddenly there came this urge of, telling this particular story. We knew we had to have a small ensemble. We knew we have to have only one main location and we wanted to make it the most special and most um, valuable um, piece of art that we could do in this time. And we had the urge that two black female leads are the most important as they are mostly neglected in the German and European landscape. Um, we don't have complex black characters in the leads. We don't have female um, complex leads. Um, and so this was, um, yeah, it's a great observation. This was part of it. And then we came into it and we had very, very, a lot of different um, topics and themes that were important to us that all fed into this movie, yeah. Hmm. I think that the theme does touch on some very subtle things. Like the, the most obvious, of course, is sci-fi and the ethics of creating androids and the ethics of creating machines that look and behave like us. 
But I think it also does touch, I think very subtly is um, the dynamics of youth and maturity because um, uh, Ela is young and she's a young android. She's like basically now discovering who she wants to be as a creation. And that, you know, and like the, there's a part of the, the, the script where she talks about breaking away. She was given away and then she ran away from the person that she was given away to. And then it's basically like a, 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 a rebellious teenager. She's like, I'm gonna run away and I'm gonna run till I can't run anymore. And then there's um, Noe who is uh, mature. She's older, she's had like more life experiences, but then in some ways, like not as much as Ela because we realize that she she's very closed off. She's very um, a solitary figure. Part of that is of course, because that you because you had to film in specific conditions because of the pandemic. But then it's like, it is a reflection of a lot of people's like lives that you can reach a certain age and still be very alone and not have a lot of like, life experience so can you both like talk about that i, I want to start with ella um, Stella, sorry talking about that from the perspective of a woman and having these two like di- these two characters who are kind of like like we as women would relate to like yeah as a woman i can relate to this young this young teenager trying to like usurp my position <laughs> yes absolutely um <clears throat> it's, it's it's my favorite part about it that we have these two female characters or yeah i'll say few women even um and they're completely opposite, and then some somehow um, um, uh, what is it? In, inspire each other to be some some somehow something else, someone else. Um, and it's been um, amazing to think about what a young and not, she's not only she doesn't only look young, of course, Ella. She is young, as you just said. She's trying to find herself, but also what does a young uh, what is a young android? Um, what does she look like? What does she behave? How how does she behave? How is she programmed by mainly science, uh, scientists who are male, probably white, who have uh, created her in some sexual way? And um, what does happen to her if she, when she sees a woman who's found herself, who's kind of happy with herself? Um, and yeah, how does that change her? And how does that open up her mind? of how much, how, what else she can be. And that's something that I can relate to totally. I can relate to both women in some way of being freed and being um, un- independent. And at the same point, being expected to be something like I'm, you have to be in a society or people expect from you. So yeah, it's a very complex topic for sure. Yeah, we tried to cover in some way a little bit and Friedrich, how do you, um, as a, as a director, just integrating that into the plot without making it very obvious? Or as a director, when you were like, is there anything that changed throughout the production where you had this idea on the script, but then seeing the dynamic between um Shari and Melody, because I think they have a very interesting dynamic. There's this sense of like they do such a fantastic job, I think, of getting the tension, but with it not with it not being very explicit. It's just little things. But like when you saw them, their performance, is there anything that changed? During production, we were like, okay, you, the two of you are bringing out something that we weren't expecting, and then you just follow that. There was a, it's a brilliant question because never anyone asked this. That that's a great observation. I mean, um, I try to be always open and observant of what is happening in the moment on set um, in pre-production, but I'm also very particular. So what I'm I come from acting, so I do intensive um, rehearsals and it started with the casting process and also with the rehearsals where, of course, the characters slightly differ when we had the script and then cast Melody, who has such a bigger age gap to Sherry Hagen. It was more like a daughter mother relationship that you can also interpret in there than only a sister relationship or something. So we inherited that there's a certain sign kind of um, energy that both actresses brought into the play which we used and which was amazing in their way of how to interact with each other so of course you try to bring this in but the biggest um, experiences or findings were when we were doing the rehearsals I mean there was a lot of doing science fiction in a student production is something that is rarely done in Germany then working with VFX having an android there were a lot of doubts of can we create this illusion and so we had to do intense um, preparations and I was so glad that Melody was so into um, bringing herself into it how to have the development from a puppet that is almost lifeless and like a cliche of an android to something that you could consider a real 
young woman that you are rooting for. And on the other hand, what brought what both actresses brought in there in an amazing thing is this um, this empathy and and um, and fear for both. I think this is something that was in the script, but both executed it in an amazing way. That you're sometimes rooting for one character, and then you're also like shouldn't I be scared of you or who, who am I'm rooting for at the moment is the human um, the more damaged um, robot than the robot actually is and so mm. all of these philosophical questions we brought in there but I was so glad to also have Stella on my side and this production team also with a uh, um, perspective as a woman as I am a man telling the story of two women and so was gl glad that we all had a, an amazing way of talking about the story and trying to bringing all of these thoughts in mm. in this really yeah. short amount of oh no for sure I, I think they were so like you talked about who should you fear and who should you support i always fear the androids always <laughs> i never trust them <laughs> this is like <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I learned early from watching things like um, Terminator, Star Trek, all of the sci-fi films and shows from back in the days. Never trust the machines. <laughs> I do not trust them. <laughs> do you know the, um, the sci-fi novel Clara and the Sun? Mm, I've heard of that, I think, yeah. Amazing novel because it's written out of the perspective of an android and this, mm. is, this is something where you can't. It's a very young and innocent and, uh, android and you can't not like her because it's her story and you empathize with her and we tried to have this with although you're against the end but we tried as much to make Ella um, kind of close to you and her needs as, as being worthy of something which I think could be extended to all minorities in our society the discussion they have at the end being like I'm worthy of something and only because you think I am not as a gay man as a transgender person as a woman as a homeless person I mean you could bring in everything it's about empathy of something that you would consider others so I um I hope we got you in this a little bit <laughs> <laughs> okay so no so when I say that I don't trust John Andrews I don't say, I'm not saying that in this film you don't achieve what you're what you're um you're seeking because you did because like as a as a as a black woman myself like um, like I, I just said some of this, the shows that I used to watch, like Star Trek, um, I used to watch things like Time Tracks, I've seen films like Bicentennial Man, which is a story told from the perspective of the android. And But, you know, very rarely did I ever see androids or machines that look like me. And I think that's also probably why I also partially don't trust the androids thinking about it now. Whereas like all the machines that we saw that were dangerous were white. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so, so yeah, like, yeah. no. Yeah thinking about it that's probably where part of a lot of my distress comes from <laughs> but then but this is also the film does talk about a bit about racism like it's very my it's very very subtle like I don't think if you're not black or if you're not a woman you won't pick up on it because like the discussion they had where they did talk about worth that's where um Ela, that's where she revealed that she was used and it's inferred from my inferences that she was used possibly as a as a for a, in a sexual component and that wasn't necessary it could have been what she was created for and that's what she was used but then she was just given away as once the the person who had her didn't find any use for her and then that's where she ran so like for me as a black woman I'm like I can relate to that because like there are ways that with black women and young black girls are hyper sexualized and like people do only perceive us in a sexual manner and then that's why she ran, um, she ran away because she's realized she realized I'm worth more than what these people created me for. I'm worth more than what than what I was used than what I was um, used for. Absolutely. I mean, <clears throat> we had a lot of discussions about how to how to portray these women and how to work with it, and it was really important to us that that as in Germany, most of black characters talk about a refugee history or their African heritage or being black. Most women talk about a man that needed to save them or something. And so we talked a lot about it. If it's, if it's even, um, yeah, if it's good that Ela's character has this perpetrator that is following her as a man, because this becomes something that is uh, then very present in her storyline and we had the feeling in the close near future of Germany it wouldn't it's just it's more truthful to still talk about the sexism that she's created by a white man who created her for sexual desires and for love desires and 
um, and she ran away and she fled it and she's her own independent woman. And so there, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of these issues um, mm. in the relationship with not um, really putting it into their dialogue, which was one of our goals. Yeah. Thank you for mentioning that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, a lot of it is inferred or you get a lot of it from just things they do and from the reactions. And one of the things that I, I absolutely love about this film is it talks about um, relationships of twos or threes. So like, um, like there's this character called Leah and she's kind of like the third person in their dynamic because Noe reveals that she had a boyfriend and like Leah, it's not, I'm like, is she, was she a best friend or sister? It's not um, defined, but then she's a third person. And then for, and then in their dynamic with um, Nui and Leah, there's also the, the shadow of this man that, that, that Ela ran away from. I saw it kind of reflected in the, um, which I, I, I just love to pay attention to things, props and set designs where in the vase, like in the vase on the shelf, they're in sets of twos and threes but then the moment where i was i started to this i the moment i started to distrust leah where she like start she you know she copied um noe catching the fly i'm like aha you're trying to copy her that's where i don't trust you <laughs> and in the background if you're not if you don't really notice it like the vase actually separates so you put them on opposite ends of the shell base. I wanted to ask you both about the about telling the story in the props and the set design because I think it's super interesting. It was like, hee -hee, I'm like, I see this, I see you. <laughs> so can you just tell me a bit about that? So Stella, can you um, talk a bit from, about that from your perspective? Well, actually, I'm so impressed by what you noticed. Amazing. Um, I was actually not, we had an amazing prop designer, it was Iris Trescher. We were so lucky to have gotten her for a, for a thesis movie. And about all the details, you have to ask Jerry. I, I, I can't really tell. <laughs> <laughs> she go into into all of the details, but I'm so happy that someone's mentioning these this details particular because people made fun of me on set because I was there, like measuring the distance between the two bases and something. And people were like no one will notice Jerry, no one. Will. And I was like, yes, that's important. Like the maniac director that that is that, that's cliche. So I'm very glad that this transported to um, to someone. And of course. There were so many thoughts into set design, which is which is always um, yeah always part. There's a lot, also a lot of pictures with um, that change if you really take care of that. On the wall. And yes, there are pictures on the wall between sisters, and these pictures also change by the mood. And it's about did Ella change them closely? Is this something the paranoia of 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 the human? So. Yeah, I think. But what Stella can say a lot about how to find this house, which was like, I think 50% of the set design was this motif that we had at the end. So that was really... Yeah, really the, the house is interesting. It kind of made me think of Hansel and Gretel. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Yeah, it looks like a fairy tale house for sure. It's not something that you see very often in Germany even. I mean, it was a very, very special house. And yeah, it's a kind of fairy tale. Uh, landscape so how did you and, find the house like how did you find this this particular house is because this cover is moss covered is like it, if you're i'm guessing if you see it from far away you can't really tell because it's like kind of camouflaged and it's small it's like in this triangle shape and it's very small and it would it would say it goes into the ground it like it's built below ground level correct uh no it's a level? level yeah yeah it looks like some of it could be like below ground level and then just like the roof i guess maybe it's because of the angle that it's like filmed like it looks yeah, like yeah yeah it's it's the house the 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 weight is all on the roof so mm. it's, it's it's called uh it's a german word whatever but uh, i mean the the main walls are the roof which is a special architecture yeah mm. and we're lucky actually we were looking for a long time uh, to find the house and then at some point um a friend of our dop of lena Katharina Krause, she's the best DOP ever. Uh, and a friend of her just texted her and said, oh, I heard you're looking for a house. A friend of mine has a cabin in the woods. And then this was it. And this was like three weeks before we started shooting. So we were, I was, we were all had, had like several meltdowns uh, before. And we were looking at so many different houses and we always, uh, we almost took another house um, just to have one. And then this perfect one mm -hmm. came up, uh, but it was very small as you just mentioned. and. Uh, especially with COVID, 
and the masks on and there were almost no people allowed in the house during the shooting so yeah it was small and the weather outside was cold and rainy and as we were shooting so much at night so yeah I, some some exhausting memories <laughs> <laughs> you're like it was good but not tiring but tiring <laughs> yes absolutely <laughs> Mm. So um, I want to talk a bit now about the te technical aspect in the acting and then as well as in the film, because like one of the first things that I, because it made me think like when we're as humans, the way we're always able to tell, well, I should say in films, the way, because like, as far as we know, androids don't exist as yet, but in films, the way how we always identify robots or androids is the fact that they don't blink. You know, like, you know, and like that's one of the most disconcerting things, because like, if we like just like we play the staring game and like just staring at somebody is very disconcerting, it's very off putting and it can make people feel physically uncomfortable. And I got to hand it to Melody like she she did that thing like where she I don't know how she managed it, but she stares very convincingly. And it, it and like in one of the op one of the I think it's the opening shot where like the camera stays on her. And you're just in the back of your head thinking, blink, please blink, because this is uncomfortable. So can you just tell me about those aspects and like the technical aspects of her of her acting? Because she does such a great job. Is she a dancer by any by any chance? Uh, she is an actress. I don't know if she has a dance background, but mm. this particular this scene was something where we were preparing to maybe um, uh, maybe save it in the post. If she's not able to do it, then we can um, do the retouches afterwards. And then on set, we did this see this particular scene, and all of us behind the camera were like, "She's not blinking." <laughs> it was like it's like forty seconds now. How is she doing it? And then I said, "Cut!" And she was actually kind of crying. And she was like. <gasps> I did it. So yes, she was amazing in how she threw herself into it and how she wanted to portray this um, android and give it some depth. And also, we have we have a history of androids uh, from Star Trek Seven of Nine, from all of these R two D two and something. Mm -hmm. We we have a history of androids, and we wanted to um, make something that you can particularly identify as being an android but sometimes not being sure if this is real or not and so mm. that was a lot a lot between um yeah for this acting yeah and she she does a very good job um because in the beginning her movements are stiff and they're very robotic but then as she starts to copy noe like they become more fluid like the dance sequence <laughs> That was kind of funny, um, but the, the, that sequence like, after that, you can tell her 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 uh, physicality changed, like her physical performance changes, and it becomes more fluid. But then, like I noticed in the in the final sequence where they're running through the woods, that like, it starts to get back robotic again. So I'm guessing that's where she starts to lose energy and she starts to kind of like go back to regress. I guess you could say as as a creation because like while she that brief window where she was. I'm more human than than a robot. That's where she was. She seemed more natural, and just um. So, so the thing with this film, like like the whole concept of it is like it, the title is I am, and it's talking about like who what's what what defines a person, what defines what makes you real, and like there is like cause there are some very interesting conversations that they have in this film. Like one of them, they're at the dining table, and like she asks, um, like Noe asks her. Like, what is your purpose? What are you made for? And then she asks Noe um, the same question back. She's like, what are you made for? And that's something like, you know, like it's very existentialist. Like, you know, that's something we are humans are as, always asking. Like, if you believe in God, even if you don't believe in God, you're just like, what is the purpose of humanity? Like, what are we all individually here for? And what are we here for as a race? So um, can both of you just talk about your own, um, like if this film may, had gave you an existential crisis of your own <laughs> as you were <laughs> as you were making it? <laughs> well, I can say I've had an existential crisis my whole life. I think <laughs> this movie was not the, the starting point. I don't know. I, I, uh, I ask myself some, yeah, I don't know. I don't have a perfect answer to what we humans are supposed to do here. It's, I think it's, it's hard and each individual should find an answer for themselves, I think, mm -hmm. yeah. And for you, Jerry, as a creator, existential crisis as a person, and then existential crisis as a director, did you have any? <laughs> <laughs> to make it short, did you have any? Come on. Um, existential is such a big word, but of course, I feel crisis is part of a creative process. So mm -hmm. I, um, I have millions of crises every day. <laughs> Um, and I think this is also part of the process. What I was really privileged in, or thankful for these 
like the author had to come up with the script very fast because we were such so behind and um we we knew when we there's a tough production schedule so we knew when we have to shoot and so he came up with the script and especially this dialogue and also some others what, what was so great to have this um, phrases that are so bigger than life mm. but also work in this in this very small um yeah in the very small dialogue between these two women yeah mm. and and like in, talking about existential crisis i think noe in particular seems to be having one um throughout the the film because like she starts to have nightmares and and then she said that she never had dreams before so i'm i was thinking oh so then did ila come as this star of like important of bad things to happen because she starts to have these dreams and they seem to be premonitions of what's going to happen in the future and it's kind of like um like i kind of saw like she was kind of running from herself and from her own past because she's being followed and like there's there's we don't know what she's running from but then in the end we see that she's she like they both end up running and they're running from the same person but for noe noe is interesting because she she says she doesn't want to dream she does she always asks either questions but she also doesn't like being asked she also doesn't like being asked questions either and then she she immediately clocks into the fear when she realizes what Ela is doing and she and it, which is interesting because like she says that she likes breaking things breaking things is fun but she also likes fixing them back um but which kind of to me tell me that she likes control but i kind of thought it was interesting that she didn't want to do that with Ela, where she where she was immediately she was like i'm not going to try to control you i'm just going to run from you i'm going to get an axe and hide in my room so she kind of seems to be a dichotomy a, 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 a character who's like kind of struggling with who she is and what she wants for herself so can you just talk a bit about um about this character um noe and then also working with um with sherry with developing her character stella do you want Oh wow that was such uh, such a uh, sharp I, I i don't know that was perfect um what we loved about the character is that she's um well she, i don't know sometimes i'm i'm i get very frustrated with her thinking about it and i'm like just say what you want say what you need what is it why are you so mad and sad <laughs> and that's what um depression sometimes looks like or sadness and grief and um it's very human to just be and and um uh, um just be alone and take a step back and uh yeah be by yourself so this new android of course comes in and ruins all of that and then somehow some way of course helps her uh coping with the grief and the pain um and yeah she has a she has a sad and and um terrible past and she has she feels guilty and yeah there there's a lot of um emotion in within her and i don't i can't even find the right words you you said that you said it so well so yeah she's a very uh, loving person but um kind of broken for it for a while mm. is that is that right jerry <laughs> <laughs> of course Yeah, I mean, it's like it, it was a brilliant observation that you had. So we are just like we could have stayed left it there as a statement. What was touching for me always this idea that maybe um, Noe is the first black woman that Ella ever sees in her life. So she's the first idol or sister or something. This idea of copying, which is always common when you when you think about children growing up, but also. sister relationships i i i really find this touching that ella just tries to find her own identity and then she's she's copying the person that is close to her but also the first woman that she sees maybe the first black person that she sees and trying to build her own uh, way through it but of course as you observed right it's a it's kind of a fairy tale we don't know where she's coming from we don't know where she's going to we don't know how often the circle already happened with her is this the 15th um, human being that she that she inherited or is this the very first one when she's thinking about her past is there is this a memory or is this something programmed to her and we left some of these uh, in particular open because in this short format there's the possibility of um, putting yourself into it and answering more philosophical questions of what is grief really about and is this all a madness of a human woman and yeah i think some of the 
um, craziness from the human is also when does it start that she questions her own perception and, and is this android trying to kill me? Is this something, what did I brought into my house? Is there something that's trying to, is this something good or bad? And so we're playing with both of these and narratives um, with, so it's all about perception, of course, and mm. the trust or mistrust. And of course, Noe, as we see her, has a lot of trust issues through her um, backstory that we would just particular touch. Yeah, that, there's two things I want to that I actually have in my notes that it was I want to go on from that from like one is the trust because she you know like you know people say imitation is the best form of flattery and in this case Noe was like this is not flattery I feel threatened I feel like you're trying to replace me I feel like you're gonna try to take my life and take and, and like you know try to become me but then there's also like she she i don't think even occurred to her that it was a form of flattery that like that ela is going to be like i just want to copy you because i think I, I i believe in you so much i i think you're such a great person that you're the, as you said she could have been the first black woman so she's modeling herself after this person that she sees in a positive um way and noe because of her background she doesn't even consider that she just thinks of it in a very sinister way immediately she's thinking you're gonna kill me it's like the body snatchers you're here to claim my life and i'm gonna run away before you try to kill me but then it's also about um about as like you said like grief but i think also um i think fear as well fear of like not knowing what your future holds like not knowing what the what the intent is uh, has because i think one of the things that throws her off is that ila never really answers questions she always asks always answers with another question she never she never reveals what she's thinking and you know that she's thinking she's very self-aware because she says she's curious so she's intelligent and she can form her own opinions about things but because she doesn't open up like no he has no choice but to mistrust who she is as as a as an android as a machine or even as a person if she starts to see her as a person she's like i can't trust you because you're not opening up to me yeah absolutely That's yeah brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> And and then yeah, like the other thing come with to... us and promote our movie always. Yeah, I need to write this down. <laughs> no, you, listen, like, you can take any poll quotes you want from anything I said and put it on the poster. That is fine by me. <laughs> yes, you are absolutely right. It's but it's a there is a double binding in this way how we perceive um, the android because she's so open and so naive and so willing into connection she wants to connect and you're like oh my god that's cute or nice and when you then come to her really crucial backstory it's like this is the saddened part about someone programmed her to be this vulnerable and open and connective and this is the sexism about it and then she's also emancipating herself being like there's this point in the script uh, in the movie where she's like no i'm not following anymore i'm not kind anymore i'm not nice anymore and this is something i think um many minorities um have throughout their life this identity of i need to i need to I need to follow the guideline. I need to come in. I need to be nice and funny and lovable. And then you come to the point maybe to say, no, I'm, I, I want to be myself and I want to be authentic. So I think this is her storyline. But um, yeah. But the other side of that is that you, but no, the other side of that is that you as the director, you actually put in a scene that kind that would shape how the audience would see her. And that's the scene with the knife. Where like she has the knife and you focus it and like for us like we see someone holding a knife and it's like that's a threat. But then yeah. like it could also be just that you like the knife is there because she's cooking, but she doesn't mean she means it. No, she's just holding it because it's innocuous and that's just what she had. But you as the director also shaped the audience's perception of that scene as well, which I think was brilliant because it could have been you're just like aha. This is like uh, this like we see the knife. We like this is a threat. Like she means it to like. <laughs> come closer and I will stab you but <laughs> but it could also just be a knife it is also just a knife it doesn't have to be it's not a weapon unless the intent is behind it of course I mean 
let's not fool ourselves. She looks kind and nice and beautiful and she's a woman and everything is fine, but she's an, an android and she could kill you. Who says that she has empathy or emotions? So this is the real threat that you were mentioning before that we should have when we create something that is a machine and uh, just fools ourselves in having emotions. Does she? Isn't she? So, of course, um, these moments, scenes that were in the script that we try to enhance throughout everything from from the hair to the makeup to the to the costume to the set design to enhance this um, suspense moments and the relationship that revelates of course um, that, that was, that's part of the philosophical question of who is the real threat are we as humans or the algorithms yeah. we create <laughs> yeah we are humans are the worst thing to happen to this planet <laughs> i'm a very cynical person <laughs> look at you you don't like you don't trust androids but also not humans listen <laughs> i'm also a very bubbly person too i'm just like those flowers that were in those vases on the wall i'm just like a spark of sunshine there um <laughs> <laughs> you ever think of um, leaving Earth, going to the moon? <laughs> Listen, we're not getting there. Elon Musk and these guys, they need to stop it. We are not getting to Earth. Or we're not getting to Venus or Mars like in anyone's lifetime on Earth. Not happening. They need to donate <laughs> that fund into creations, into creatives like for you. And like, you know, they go give some money to some um, from development funds. That's what they should do. <laughs> yeah. Oh, <man. laughs> but uh, But the second thing I wanted to mention is like, um, like I talked about the dreams and a premonition, but one scene in the in kind of like the sequence close to the end that stands out is the dancing. And um, there's this scene, you know, where they have on like the sparkly guns and they're dancing. And that kind of made me think like this is a dance they've done before. I'm like, I was because I was wondering, is Noe even also human herself? I was I started to think I started to question if she was human and like, if this is just a cycle that the both of them keep repeating, like this is just some really bad like alternate reality or, or play that is being done by developers again because i don't trust people like they're just testing these robots to see that like, how far into reality can they go like how much how much how real can they go because like Ela trusts that noe is human she doesn't test her she just trusts that she's human because noe says that she is wow yeah that's an interesting setting that you came up with i love it i love it i don't trust anyone <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> totally. No, because we saw the little orbs floating ahead. So I was, I'm like, okay. So if these orbs are monitoring one android, if they're, if one, if it, one, if it's one orb to one android, that means there's like dozens of androids in this forest. So I'm thinking, so who's to say that Noe is all is not even being monitored by one of these um orbs as well? Of course, I mean the the whole the whole short place with the with the uh, with the question of what is real and what is human. The whole short could also be considered as the dream of an android, of course. Mm -hmm. But we lingering ourselves on there's an android and a human woman, and the human woman finds the android, and they have this connection. And the the, the philosophical question at the end is: Can an android dream? And what does a dream of an android look like? And where does she? she observes all of these um, images that she creates into something is this a dream or only the machine going off and what is the bigger world behind it so i love this we went through all of these uh, philosophical questions yes hmm. that's the name of it but isn't it isn't it do androids dream of is it electrical sheet oh my it's the name of the book um of sheeps it's a very famous yeah do androids dream of sheep right yeah, 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 it's it's from the sixties or seventies. It's yeah. like, uh, um, yeah, it I think it was made into a play often, and so. Yeah, yeah. I think it was. Like, um, I'm glad I was... not dreaming of sheep. <laughs> yeah, is it? Um, is Lovecraft? Is it that's from Lovecraft? I think, or is it H.G. Wells? Yeah, it... Oh, I don't even know. Yeah, what a shame. <laughs> I'm gonna Google that. But yeah. um, <laughs> so the other thing I want both of you to talk about next is the pro actual production of the of the film. Like we talked a bit about finding the house and the location, but can you talk a bit about the technical aspects, like for the VFX? And you know, like 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 how did you decide like what you wanted Ela to look like? We saw like the the dummy, which is supposed to be like her before she becomes animated, which so that that's like something that had to be created for the set as well. And then there's the VFX for her eyes. And I'm sure there's many things that we don't perceive as being like digital, but they are. So can both of you talk a bit about that that aspect of the production? Yes, well, we both, uh, this was our first uh, movie with so much 3D and visual effects uh, in it. So we started as newbies and beginners and, uh, 
ended as the same actually but it's um it's been a great uh, experience and um well Ella what I don't know if we should tell all the secrets but I think you've seen it all I don't think there's any hidden hidden effects actually in the film the the from from the beginning on it was clear to us that we wanted to uh, uh, make it look as real as possible and uh, we didn't have the biggest resources that Hollywood productions have of course so we knew it had to be the small small details that we can afford and uh, it was clear to us that the eyes had to be a one one very special thing and um they're not they're not uh, animated in in all of the scenes uh, thank god so <laughs> we tried to take the special moments and make them even more stand out to yeah underline the 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 yeah the power in it and the power in Ela of course mm. Yeah, and we had a great, great VFX team uh, under the lead of Leonard Schrader, who really helped us because he had a lot of experience in, in, in VFX and what are the particular moments, what can we do? Yeah, as Stella said, most of the VFX you see, there's some minor touches as it where it, it was important that the Android is not moving, so we stabilized the picture or something like this. This happens at very, very minor points, but most of it is acting. Um, as you see, and then what was the most complicated is the the opening of the doll in the back when you mm. look into her body and also when you look into the side because we knew we can only have like two or three very particular shots but these should be so prevailing that you believe this um, uh, this idea that this is not real it's a puppet or not um, we worked with a puppet actually with like a real doll that that was in the same size and the same physiques, especially for the for the naked scenes, for the breast scenes, where we wanted to have this real feeling of because um, a real body moves different than than plastic, and so we wanted to have this um, this concept of oh my god, it's it's is it real or not? Yes, and so there was it was a lot of fun to work on that. Also the dramaturgy of the eyes. When does this android have which color and which eyes? Yeah. Mm. Okay, so I wanted to add, you mentioned that, so that's also something I wanted to ask you, like, so I wanted to ask you, how come you made, decided to make the eyes blue instead of brown? Because this is something that's also very common in sci-fi, where if you have a, um, a an android, the eyes are generally uh, blue, like this uh, very electric blue. And I was thinking like, it would have been, I, maybe it was just, I, it was just me, because I was thinking it would have been even more creepy if her eyes were brown, you know, like brown, like, um, like noise. You know, so I wanted to ask you about that. That was just me being, that's just me being super nerdy too. Cause they're just like, it would have been super creepy if her eyes were brown. So um, could you just say a bit about that decision? <laughs> but her real eyes are brown. So it needed to be something that looks more, I mean, everything we decided was to enhance the story and to enhance the conflict that we wanted. And for her, it's very important that you, that you, that you believe that this is an Android, although mm -hmm. it's a, an actress playing it. And so, unnatural colors were more more likely to play into this narrative it could have been yellow it could have been green it could have been red it could have been violet we tried all of these uh, all of these colors and it was very clear we thought about blue and bluish colors also for the tones for the whole whole movies but then we tried them all and blue was the most prevailing because as you see it's also the biggest contrast um, when you see <laughs> yeah, mm. it is. the biggest <laughs> contrast to the, to the brown yes um, yeah someone actually had the feedback that this is um connective connected also to stereotypes of of um white male man having blue eyes and she's like observing that um there was not an intention but i like the interpretation about that too. Mm, yeah and also the so the the, the book that I was thinking is Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep is by Philip K. Dick. And I remember they did a series about, I think it was on Amazon, Amazon series like about a few years ago um, um, based on the book. So that's what it was. Yes. <laughs> okay, Good. great. Yes. Um, so before we wrap up, um, is there anything that you would like to share with uh, with my listeners and audiences about the film? Because I know you've shown um, at a few film festivals and it's also eligible for the Student Academy Award. So can you just talk about um, the the journey from you know conception to um to film festival because i know the film festival circuit is it can be tiring 
it's hard <laughs> it's difficult and it's a lot to go through and then like um and then like it, it takes like I, I a lot of people don't realize but like the film festival circuit can last like a year year and a half depending because like, you start at the beginning of the year and then you go technically into the next year after where you have like for this one is um because it's um eligible for the um street academies that will be the oscars for next um next february so that's like over a year so how has that journey been for the both of you well, it's been it's been a rough a rough ride or a long ride. It was great. We have um, uh, support from our school, from our film school. They also um, care take care about um, some festival admissions, but uh, submissions and admissions. But we also tried to get into it the whole festival scene. And as you mentioned, it's quite complicated and can be very tiring, but it can be so uplifting as well. And we've had amazing um, festivals that we um, came. Uh, like yeah we were running in the in the competitions and we ha came into the finale of the um uh student academy award we didn't win it though um but we won the st martha's winner the american african-american film festival which is amazing and now we're eligible for the short film oscar so it's still ongoing um but yeah no it's very exciting it's been a very exciting with jerry jerry and i have been uh, looking at all the film festivals worldwide almost <laughs> and the most tiring i think it, it was that we couldn't connect to real audience because, mm. because most of it was in a pandemic yeah. and most yeah. of it was digital so uh, as we are film lovers stella and i we love to talk to audiences or being at a kind of something where you can really have this interaction with audience and this was very rare so when you only have this digital platform through a laptop or through something that is virtual it doesn't feel like that so um, we still hope that to your audiences that a lot of people are still seeing the movie it's still running as Stella said we are we are um, waiting for the shortlist for the um, Oscars but also um, hoping that the film can be seen on some more festivals and mm. we are also online everyone can contact us through Instagram or whatever if they want to know when the next dates are so yeah oh for sure like what i'll do is for my blog post um i'll put some i'll ask uh shaima about the dates that and like the fast for festivals and i can put those in as where like, it, like I, I watched it through vimeo is that the only platform where it can be seen for now apart from festivals yeah the vimeo one is is unfortunately only for uh some private and press uses because our film school is very strict with giving the link out, but I hope um, in a few years maybe they, it'll be public. But as long as we're running on festivals, it's not it's not public yet. So that's but a shame. all the festivals have their their platforms where they're showing it. So, uh, yes, thanks to the pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> this gosh darn pandemic. <laughs> Hopefully yeah. it'll be picked up by a platform soon because I know like Amazon and I think Hulu also they um generally have um some some specific lists where you can watch like short films and stuff so hopefully you get that you, you guys get it on one of those platforms where oh it, thank you that would be amazing yeah love yeah. that if someone's listening who's part of that platform <laughs> <is the movie. laughs> sure but like Amazon put them up <laughs> okay this has been such a great chat thank you for, so much for the both of you for speaking to me this was a lot of fun and again I, I congrats on the film i hope you guys see this was i like i i think you, i've said multiple times i don't trust androids but i do love watching films with, um, with them i'm a sci-fi geek <laughs> so like this was like this was right up my alley and i just love when things get deep and existential and you know philosophical which is i think one of the best things about sci-fi it allows us to like tap into so many different discussions in very unexpected ways and the film does that in very very um great detail and disconcerting ways as well <laughs> thank you so much for having us and yeah it was a pleasure speaking to you thank you so much for your time and also for this great observation of all the details of the film and the questions so thank you so much and have you're welcome day. You're welcome. You can go back and tell the crew, like, yes, someone did pay attention to the vibes. Yes, yes we will. of course, we will. <laughs> we can boast and gloat about that for years to come. You say, see, it still matters. <laughs> yes, it yes. does. I think it does, of course. <laughs> All right, thank, thank you, you so much. Have a wonderful night. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.